Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Rob Hobson. I'm the application scientist for Vutara, based in Salt Lake City. Um, today I'm going to tell you about the Vutara SRX, uh, the Vutara 352 and SRX software with integrated fluidics, and um, a little bit about single molecule localization microscopy and its use in superlens. And I'll give you some examples and some uh, new technologies we're developing too. So first of all, uh, why super resolution? Well, um, as biologists, most of the things we're interested in are actually below the diffraction limit of light. So if objects are closer than 200 nanometers apart, we can't discern them using light. So we need a way to beat that diffraction limit. So the Vutara uses uh, single molecule localization to beat the diffraction limit of light. So how does that work? So if you have an object in a cell, it's below the diffraction limit of light, um, say this tubule, 250 nanometers in diameter. We can label this with fluorophores evenly across its surface. If you look at the ensemble fluorescence of this, we get this diffraction limited blur and we can't um, localize it. However, if we have a way to stochastically activate uh, one or two molecules at a time and isolate these point spread, fun point spread functions, um, we can use our uh, SRX software to very accurately localize the center point of that point spread function. And then we can activate more molecules localize them, rinse and repeat until we have all the molecules registered and localized. And therefore we built an image uh, below the diffraction limit of light. And so in principle what that means is we activate a few fluorophores at a time and make a movie of them blinking and then localize, fit, and then um, record um, on the computer the position of those center points of those fluorophores. So in practice what this looks like is this tubulin um, labeled sample we, in this case, we're using D-Storm, hit them with very high laser power and a special buffer, uh, get them to blink, and then record. And then the software in real time localizes each one of those blinks, point spread functions, and then builds an image at the time. And there's various techniques to get these things to blink, so palm or storm or DNA paint. But the idea is just to cast the activity a few fluorophores in time and then uh, localize them. So the Vutara, just over there, if you have any more questions about it, I can show you. Just an uh, overview of it. It's a super resolution system designed specifically for single molecule localization. Um, it has a 3D localized data based on propriety biplane technology, which I can go into more detail at the, at the system if you're interested. But it gives us 20 nanometer XY precision, and in every experiment you get 50 nanometer Z precision too. And it's wide field illumination um, with a spatial filter in the super res path. But there's no point spread function engineering involved. Um, so that means we can dim image deeper than other single molecule systems. Um, we have fluidics enabled. So in the software and hardware, integrate, uh, the fluidics system integrated into the hardware. So we can do for sequential labeling applications, which I'll briefly hit on later in the talk. And we have a rich software environment for the acquisition and data analysis built into the system. So I'll just go through some basic examples. So it, the Vitara is used in various uh, systems. Um, but I'll focus just on the neuroscience applications today. So um, we can do simple experiments like this. This is uh, just a three-color labeled hippocampal neuron in culture. So the dendrites labeled with MAP2, and we have PSD95 um, labeled in magenta, and uh, uh, the presynaptic marker bassoon labeled in, 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 in um, cyan. So you can see things like synapses forming in culture, quite simply. However, because we don't do point spread function engineering, it's quite simple to do uh, tissue sections here. So here we have uh, a similar experiment where we're looking at um, uh, two different types of neurons, this time in retinal tissue. So we have in magenta, PSD95 labeled um, in the rod terminals, and in green, PKC alpha, showing the rod bipolar cells. And so what you can't see in uh, um, standard imaging is actually how these rod bipolar cells uh, interpolate between the, the synapses of the PSD95 labeled rod terminals. So we can also do in human sections. So again, similar idea, characterize synapses in human uh, uh, tissue sections. Again, these are just 10 micron tissue sections, um, but, but able to characterize the, the size and the localization of uh, different classes of synapse within the human frontal lobe. Um, but the, the, the key um, uh, advantage of the Vitara over, over systems, like I said, is that well, 10 microns is nice uh, tissue section. Be able to image deeper tissue section, deeper and um, thicker tissue sections, because we don't do any point spread function engineering. So here, uh, Janosch Heller uh, in UCL took 40 micron hippocampal slices, um, 
and label three labels in them. And so in the top row here, you can see the wide field image taken on the Vitara, and then below the super resolved image. So GLIT1 labels uh, astroglioomarker, um, a uh, excitatory amino acid transporter. And he also labeled pre- and postsynaptic markers in those cells. So in green, Homer, the postsynaptic marker, and red, the soon, presynaptic marker. He was able to overlay these. And so it was able to get excellent synaptic, synaptic resolution in relatively thick tissue sections. And so here we can blow up that image, and you can see the synapses really clearly. And also, just to point out that um, because we use the biplane technology, every image you take is 3D as well. So not only do we get that XY resolution, but we can also see where the synapses are located in relation to the astroglio marker in this. And so in this paper, they discovered that the GLIT1 marker was more closely localized with the postsynaptic marker than the presynaptic marker. Um, because again, because of that ability to image deep, we can image intact organisms. So fly larvae, or in this case, C. elegans, we're looking at. Yeah. So this is the ventral nerve cord of C. elegans, an intact animal labeled with um, a snap and halo tag labeled dies. And so the worm was uh, labeled and then fixed and then imaged on the Vutara. All right. Oh, no. There we go. So you can see we're getting excellent super resolved images of the C. elegans synapses uh, in the ventral cord. You can't do this by standard imaging because in a standard uh, ventral cord, all these synapses kind of bleed into each other below, below the diffraction of light. Whereas here now we can easily see the, the synaptic vesicles and the endosome marker. And um, another use of the Vitara we've been um, working with lately is uh, with for live cell uh, single molecule localization microscopy, which is a very challenging technique, but uh, feasible with some of the new dyes that are available now. And so um, the techniques I showed you before at D-Storm require very high laser powers and are generally phototoxic for live cell applications. Um, so, for, so things like using D-Storm or even these photoactivatable dyes, which need a 4 or 5 activation, can be quite toxic for long-term energy experiments. So the use of either protein floors, which blink, like such as photoactivatable uh, GFP or EOS, or these new classes of dyes, the spontaneously blinking HMSIR, or the glitter bomb dyes from Luke Lavis, make live cell applications much more feasible now. Um, so I won't go through all of this stuff, but I will go for a collaboration with him working with Luke Lavis at Genelia for the live cell imaging. So here, this is the glitter bomb dye. This is based on Luke's Genelia farm dyes. Um, so it's a standard Genelia farm uh, 549 dye, but with this coumarin group added, which changes. So um, what happens is this, this uh, dye um, forms and breaks a bond over uh, here, which when this bond is formed, the dye is non-fluorescent, and when it's broken, it's fluorescent. The pKa of that is 5, so at neutral pH, most of the dyes are off. And so that means um, they spontaneously blink. You don't need to hit them with high laser power. Here we have uh, mitochondria labeled, uh, halo tag mitochondria labeled with a glitter bomb dye, um, imaged continuously for 30 minutes. So this is two seconds per frame. So mitochondria is just quite sensitive to photo damage uh, from this. So in fact, we can use very low laser power and continuous image and get happy mitochondria moving. Just we can actually do live cell, single molecule imaging quite well with these dyes. And neurons are especially sensitive to photo damage uh, for, with high laser power. And so here we have an experiment using the glitter bomb dyes and a photoactivatable GFP um, in live hippocampal neurons done in Eric Jorgensen's lab at the University of Utah. So here, the grad student Tian Vu labeled expressed um, CAXBOX photoactivatable GFP to paint the membrane and synaptobrevin halo with the glitter bomb dye. So he painted the membrane of the, the neuron um, with, the, with the photoactivatable GFP, expressed the halo tag uh, glitter bomb dye, and was able to get this 3D image of live neurons in, a, in, a, in live hippocampal neurons. So here we're just showing that this was a single plane taken, just so we get this nice 3D data um, using the Futara. But also I want to show that this is also a live image too. So um, now we can see the individual molecules of synaptic brevin moving within the neuron too. With very little photo damage too, so we can image these guys for a long time. Tien's long-term goal is to actually monitor the synaptic vesicle cycle live in these neurons. Um, I'm going to go through briefly some new techniques we have. We've been uh, collaborating with several groups to do this. One is DNA paint, where we've been working with Ralph Youngman's group and Pong Yin's group 
to um, do multiplex labeling of proteins on the Vitara. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the oligostorm methods we've been working with Ting Wu's lab at Harvard, where we multiplex imaging multiple probes along the, 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 in, in, in the genome to do um, multiple location fish in the system. So the, the key of these paint techniques is that they allow serial labeling applications. So how does DNA paint work? Just as a brief overview, you label the same way as you would in your normal sample, except instead of having a fluorophore on your antibody, now you have a barcoded uh, oligo, so you can wash it. So then, in your, while you're imaging, you basically flood your buffer with uh, a complementary oligo with a fluorophore on. And then the length of these oligos determines their binding on and off time. So if you've got a short enough oligo, they'll bind for 100, 200 milliseconds and unbind. And when you see, you see them bind, they'll sit down on the camera and you'll sit down long enough and you'll be able to capture them. So you just repeat that over that till it, all your uh, uh, antibodies are labeled and you get an image based on that. So the major advantage of this technique is, um, well, there's two major advantages. One, it gives you a lot more photons. You can collect a lot more photons, so your localization precision can be much higher. And two, it um, lets you, allows you to multiplex by doing on how many you can barcode on your different uh, antibodies. So here in uh, Young Yuen's experiment uh, from the Nature Methods paper he has, he barcoded four different um, antibodies with different oligos, washed in and performed storm well, DNA paint imaging of these guys. So he's able to image microtubules, uh, mitochondria, peroxisomes, and the Golgi, and then build this four-color image. And so we can do this on the Vitara too, just as a proof of principle. We can label microtubules and get uh, very high uh, photon counts. So now we're getting 15,000 photons position, which means we're getting a very high radial and uh, axial uh, localization precision on here. So here, even on this, um, taken on a water immersion objective, relatively low in A, we can see the, uh, the lumen of the mitochondria, uh, the microtubule label on there. And so another collaboration we have going on is uh, using a similar technique but called oligostorm. And here it's the same idea, you just have barcoded. It's just barcoded to, um, to paint the, uh, uh, the, 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 the chromosomes. So here you label the chromosomes with different barcodes, this fish technique, and then you come in and you sequentially label each one of these little portions of the chromosome you've labeled. So here they've done an experiment where they labeled 20 different portions, sequentially washed in, labeled image portion probe one here, then wash out, then repeat image probe two here, like so, this one here, then wash in, wash out, and repeat this 20 times till they build up a structure of the chromosome in space. So how do we do that sequential labeling using the Vitara? So one, we have our integrated fluidic system. In there. So we have a customized fluidic uh, uh, platform um, uh, developed um, for use with the Vitara. This allows us to have several different wash buffers and then 15 of these hot swappable hybridization probe buffers so you can wash and integrate and wash out. And then this is fully integrated into our SRX software for control and ease of use. So there's a little button here that says fluidics. So you open that button and then you can program on the left here what buffers you have, whether they're loaded, or what they are. And then you can set up a fluidic cycle um, during your imaging. So it'll run this program once you run imaging. So wash perform the washes, perform the labeling, image, and perform the next step, again, re 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 and then repeat and repeat until you're done with the probes. And the probe support is basically unlimited. I think the most they've done on the chromosome image is about 30 different probes right now. And then I'll just briefly go over the SRX software, the modular workflow. So the software allows you to localize, then visualize, and analyze the data all in real time. And you can get a trial version of software of data to look at if you want to try it out. And just to go back a little bit, um, so the images you're taking with um, uh, the single molecule technique are not really images. They're actually a CSV file of localization. So it's an XYZ map of positions, right? Which gives us some unique analysis tools. Since they're not getting a picture, we're getting a map of molecular positions of these probes. So that allows us to visualize the data in special ways. So using the SRX software, you can just visualize that point cloud. So each one of the points is just rendered as a position in the space, X, Y, Z. You can visualize that. You can then put convex, fit it with a convex hull alpha or alpha shapes on there to see the 3D structure of the object. Or a wireframe if you want to see the underlying structure of it too with the localizations. It also gives us a lot of measurement tools which are possible using the software. 
So because we have this um, uh, uh, point cloud data, we get a, a very powerful tool to do spatial distribution analysis, cluster analysis, especially DP scan, which is useful for um, looking at clustered data, co-localization tools, including specific tools for single molecule data or instead of looking at overlapping just fluorescent blobs, we're actually looking at overlapping of clouds of molecules. Um, you do resolution analysis um, to actually give you a, the overall re a resolution of your image. And also the ability to generate uh, live cell analysis, um, the particle tracking, et cetera, and control data to generate just some statistically random data to compare. So just as the, the final thing very briefly, I'll do a little example of some stuff we did in Eric's lab, lab with C. elegans using some of the statistical analysis tools. So here we have C. elegans labeled with uh, the, the, the L-type and N-type calcium channels are labeled in the active zone protein. Um, Sean in the lab and performed a co-localization analysis. So here on the left is just the tools we have. Um, specifically, the pair correlation nearest neighbor, the joint histogram, and the store RLA are very useful for analyzing single molecule data. So the pair correlation, he showed that this now that the CAF2 channel is more closely uh, localized with the active zone marker, whereas the CAV1 was very little um, uh, cross pair. There's a very low cross, cor uh, cross correlation pair coefficient value, suggesting that it's the CAV2 or the N type channel is actually the one localized to the center of the synapse, whereas the L type channel is localized to the periphery of the synapse in this experiment. Finally, just to show, there's also a cluster analysis tool in there, is useful. So you can use that to filter out unclustered data. Just look at your clusters you're interested in. And also, it's really useful for actually doing co-localization analysis, too. So you get a bunch of um, parameters based on uh, cluster analysis tools. So you can get things like density, the area, the surface area, and a bunch of other statistics. You can also get a measure of how many molecules of that probe 3 are within that cluster of probe 1. And we have further tools. The storm RLA tool is also really useful for measuring overlap of call, uh, for, um, probes, et cetera. And that's it. Just an overview. We can get quantitative data in a matter of minutes. We can uh, localize the data in real time, uh, visualize while it's localizing, and then begin analysis right away. And that's it. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs>